This is the actual box of my graphics card from the year 2001. In it was a GeForce 2MX with 32MB of memory. If you believe the marketing department, then this is supposed to be a golden sample. But there is nothing golden about it. It is a regular GeForce 2MX. Nothing special. That this card is still in my possession is a miracle. It should not be a surprise to anyone watching this video when I tell you that this card is broken. When used in a system, the motherboard makes all the right sounds indicating a successful boot. But we do not get any video output. A diagnostic card seems to get stuck at postcode 4E, which ironically tries to inform the user about any errors, including video errors, on screen. Unfortunately, the card has been further damaged by my own doing. Some time ago, I wanted to practice removing larger components from PCBs using hot air. Well, this card is broken, so I thought it would be the perfect subject for removing memory ICs. In the process, I ripped off one pad below a memory pin and twisted the trace in the process. Then, a few months ago, I managed to repair this Elsa Synergy 2 with a simple BIOS update. As it turned out, a few flipped bits in the aging BIOS chip made this card unusable. The GeForce 2MX has very similar symptoms that the Elsa Synergy 2 had before I flashed the BIOS. What if a simple BIOS update is all that is required to bring this GeForce 2MX back to life? But before I can do that, I first need to undo the damage caused by me. And maybe I will be able to revive this GeForce 2MX. But before we get into the topic, a quick word from my sponsor. If you're in need of PCB manufacturing, 3D printing or CNC machining, you should check out PCBWay.com. I have ordered 4 batches of different PCBs so far and their quality always impressed me. You will find all my projects on PCBWay's shared project space and links in the video description. Once I get the time to learn more about 3D printing, I'm going to use their 3D printing services as well. Have a look at PCBWay.com and turn your projects into reality. At the end of 1999, Nvidia introduced the original GeForce 256 with SD memory. However, its launch price of over 250 US dollar made it unaffordable for most users. Interestingly, this high price may have been a blessing in disguise, as just two months later, Nvidia released the DDR version of the GeForce 256. This newer version proved to be significantly faster, especially in higher resolutions and 32 bit color rendering. Unfortunately, the initial lineup of the first generation of GeForce cards lacked a low-cost or mainstream-friendly model. This gap in the market segmentation was supposed to be filled by the aging TNT2 chipset. I skipped the first generation of GeForce, which to this day provides the brand name to Nvidia's gaming graphics line. But there was hope. Nvidia was on a 6-month release cycle back then, releasing new generations twice a year. When Nvidia released the GeForce 2 in September 2000, I finally could move on. But not with the GeForce 2 Ultra or GTS. No, I got the GeForce 2 MX. For around 120 US dollars, this card was supposed to elevate my games to a totally different level. You know, with transform and lighting and all the new advancements that have been put into those new GeForce chips. And although I was happy to get the card, I quickly found out that this card performed as well as a GeForce 256, somewhere between the SDR and the DDR version. But I didn't care. I finally was the proud owner of a GeForce. This GeForce 2MX replaced my Diamond Viper 550, a graphics card based on the Nvidia River TNT chipset. The GeForce was replaced later by an ATI Radeon 9500, but this will be a topic for another video. As far as I remember, this GeForce 2 MX always caused me headache. Sometimes, when I switched on the PC, there was no video out, but at that time, a power cycle would fix it. Now, it does not. Furthermore, this card was not stable. I don't know if it was because of the drivers or the card itself. All I know is that my card was equipped with a simple passive heatsink. At some point, the card would drive me towards ATI and the Radeon 9500. When I recently rediscovered this GeForce 2MX in a basement storage box, I thought to myself, I will figure out what is wrong with you, and if I won't, then it is finally time to part ways. Initially I blamed solder joints on memory chips and possibly the GPU, but many tests applying pressure to each individual chip never changed the behavior of the card. Still believing in my original theory of loose solder joints, I tried to reflow the solder on each memory chip. But when I did this about a year ago, I was way less experienced. And I did not have a microscope. 
Just to make sure I did not create an unwanted solder bridge while reflowing the solder, I decided to test continuity of adjacent pins of the memory chips. I am happy I did, because those two pins are bridged. I tried to remove the bridge by just using my soldering iron, but the pins remained shorted. Unfortunately, I had this card in a system to test in this state, and of course it was powered on. If I bridged a power pin to a data pin, then this could be the end of the memory chip. Let's quickly have a look at the datasheet of the memory chip and the pinout. The pins that are shorted are pins 6 and 7. Uh oh, VSS is connected to the data pin. VSS is part of the power delivery system, but let's have a look at the pin description. All this information can be found in the datasheet of the memory chip. VSSQ is a ground connection for data output. I think this is good news, because I don't think we can damage a chip by grounding a data pin. You have seen me remove the electrolytic capacitors already. Those can violently explode when exposed to heat. And I'm not planning to get blinded by sharpness of exploding aluminum capacitors. Now that the chip is removed and the pads are cleaned, we can check if the short is coming from the pads on the PCB or the chip itself. Hopefully it was just a solder bridge that was hidden deep under the pins so it was not visible before under the microscope. The board does not have a short between those two pins. That is good. I tested the chip as well and there is also no short anymore between pin 6 and 7. So I think we are good, it may just have been a very tiny solder bridge. Now we can go ahead and resolder the chip. But before I do, I straighten the pins that were bent during the removal process. I want to make sure that I do not have to repeat any of the steps just because I take a shortcut here and there. Anyway, once the chip is back on the board, tested and verified that none of the adjacent pins are bridged, it is time to debug the card. And maybe we can simply flash the BIOS. I found this website which has a lot of BIOS versions listed, including a BIOS for this GeForce 2MX. My card does not have a TV out port, so I will use version 3.11.0.8.0. This is also the version that is currently on the BIOS chip. How I know that will be the topic of another video. Now let's try the card and see if any of the soldering did something, for better or worse. Maybe we don't even have to do anything. No, the card still behaves like before. There is no video output. In order to access the card that doesn't provide a picture, we can plug in a second video card. In my case, I just use a random PCI card. Plug the monitor into this card and we are ready to boot into DOS. When I revived the Elsa Synergy 2, I went through several flashing utilities. The easiest to use was WF Flash from LeadTech and I will be using this tool again. The good thing is that the tool detects the GeForce 2 MX, so there is some sign of life. The tool allows us to have a look at the first few bytes of the BIOS that is currently on the card. So we do get some data off the BIOS chip. Ok then, let's try to flash a new BIOS to this chip and hopefully that is all we have to do. Then this would be the second card that just required a simple BIOS flash to be revived. But unfortunately the tool fails to flash a new BIOS to the chip. I don't know what this error means exactly, but I assume it is an issue with reading data off the chip because the tool fails while trying to verify some data. No matter what I tried, I was not able to flash the BIOS successfully. I even tried different BIOS versions, made a backup of the current BIOS and tried to flash it back and erased the BIOS chip. Nothing worked. At this point I think we may have a damaged BIOS chip. A simple bit flip is not the cause of this card not giving a video output. This card has a BIOS chip that looks very different from BIOS chips on a lot of other cards I have. But that should not be an issue because I ordered a programmer some time ago, which we will be using today. To flash the chip I have to remove it from the board. The programmer by itself is a little bit expensive, but the adapters on their own are a lot worse. I tried to get a bundle with a couple of useful adapters to reduce the follow up cost. Hopefully the correct adapter for my special BIOS chip was included in that bundle. This one looks like it could potentially be the right adapter. But as you can see the socket is way too large for this chip. I went back to the store on AliExpress to see if I could have done better. But no, the adapter I need is not part of any bundle. When you watch this video I have already placed an order to get this specific adapter. It states that it is suitable for 8 by 14 mm chips which fits the size of this BIOS chip. The adapter will cost around 50 US dollars. Quite steep, but I want to investigate more what is going on with this BIOS chip. 
If you don't want to miss this, then I suggest to subscribe to my channel. So, since we cannot flash the original chip of this card, I had to come up with a backup plan. Fortunately, when I planned the repair of this card, I ordered the BIOS chip in a different package as well. As you can see here, in the area where the original BIOS chip was located are pads that accept BIOS chips in PLCC packaging. I should be able to solder this chip in place of the original chip using the until now unused pads. And since I may need several flash attempts to find the correct and working BIOS file, I also decided to add a socket. All part of the backup plan. Now let's have a look at the software that came with the programmer. It takes only a couple of minutes to find your way around. A really nice feature is that once you pick the chip that you want to program, you have the possibility to get help on which adapter to use and the orientation you need to place the chip on the programmer. Before we write the BIOS file to the new chip, let's first read what is on it. It looks like it's all random data, nothing interesting. But we can read from the chip. At least this is going somewhere. Let's select the BIOS file that we want to write to the new chip. The version is the one I have showed you before. The content of the file will be shown on the screen. And now we just have to program it to the chip. And that is it. That was really easy. Now we can go ahead and place this BIOS chip on the card. Mind the correct orientation and test if all this card needed was a new BIOS chip. And look at this! I haven't seen this splash screen for over 20 years. Before I can test the card in Windows, I have to reattach the heatsink. Unfortunately, the passive cooler was glued to the chip with some adhesive thermal tape. So I had to create a temporary solution. With the original heatsink, thermal paste, a few zip ties and a fan, I think this may actually be a better cooling solution than just having a passively cooled card. The card is now assembled and ready to be tested under Windows. Windows detects the graphic card correctly and I can install the graphic card drivers without any issues. I use Everest Home Edition to get some additional information about the card. The card operates at 2x AGP speed, but this is a limitation of the ASUS P3BF motherboard I'm using. Otherwise, the GPU is clocked at 175MHz and the memory is connected via 128-bit data bus and clocked at 166MHz. We have two pixel pipelines and two texture mapping units per pipeline. The card supports DirectX 7. I did test the card briefly by running a few benchmarks, just to see if there is any instability or artifacts. But the card was working absolutely fine. I have a feeling that this card will appear very soon on the channel again. There are a few questions that I need an answer for. Like, what is going on with the golden sample sticker on the box? Was passive cooling enough or was overheating the cause I had mixed feeling about this card 20 years ago? And I definitely want to know what is wrong with the original BIOS chip. Once I get the correct adapter, I am curious what the programmer has to say. So here you have it. This is the second card that does not work due to an issue with a BIOS chip. Imagine how many cards were thrown away because their owners believe they are broken. And I also wonder how many cards I will find in the future that suffer from a similar issue. So I don't want to make this video any longer. I hope you enjoyed the content and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. This is the best way to not miss any upcoming videos. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.